Good morning, Buddha Kroiso. Welcome. It's good to see you. Welcome to uh, our Bible study blog this morning. Just 10 minutes or so in the Word of God, looking at the uh, 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you've come from, we give you a very warm welcome and trust that you feel very much at home with us <coughs> as we <coughs> gather together around Lord God's Word. <coughs> Acts then and chapter 17. The second missionary journey recorded for us in the Acts of the Apostles, it starts in chapter 16, it continues into chapter 17, and of course it goes beyond. Now in chapter 17 we have the account of the Apostle Paul and his travelling companion, a guy by the name of Silas, visiting three distinct places, namely Thessalonica, and then Berea, and then Athens. Now, it's something that we read of in the visit to Athens that drew my attention as I was thinking and preparing for this morning. In all three places that we find recorded uh, here in this chapter, we find a common theme, if you like. There is the preaching of the gospel. People are converted. There is opposition and the evangelists have to move on. And the gospel is on the move in the sovereignty of God. The kingdom of God is being extended. Athens was slightly different from the other two in that the Apostle Paul comes into contact with a different group of people. They were called philosophers, and they were to be found often debating things which were new, which were controversial. And when the Apostle Paul spoke to them, they referred to him, would you believe it, as a babbler, a babbler. They called him a babbler because, uh, well, it says in verse 18, he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. I want to think specifically about the word resurrection this morning and where that word resurrection fits in to the general scheme of things as far as you and I are concerned, as far as everyday life as Christians are concerned. Now, I cannot do it justice in 10 minutes. Of course I cannot. It would take any preacher a lot, lot longer than that to do justice to the subject. But just some thoughts really to dwell on during the course of the day. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's think about it. When we talk or think about the death of the Lord Jesus, then I trust that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is never far from our discussions and thoughts. That's vitally important. Talking to Gwyn last week, and he was saying to me that every time he thinks about the open, the empty tomb, it draws a hallelujah from him. And I think I fall into the same category, and I trust that you do as well. The subject of the resurrection is exciting. Now, amongst unbelievers, and I say this very carefully, but as far as people who don't share our faith are concerned, well, they very often think that Christianity has no power. People at Christmas time are confronted by the image of a baby. Baby in a manger, how sweet they might say, but they don't see any power at all. At Easter, they're confronted by a dead person hanging on a cross, a dead person, and they see nothing of any power. I remember when Elizabeth and I lived in Benidorm for seven months. Yes, Benidorm. Um, I'd been asked to be the minister of the English church in Benidorm for a period of seven months. And, uh, well, Benidorm, during the course uh, of those months, which are not in the season, which are not the popular ones, quite pleasant, really. And uh, we used to enjoy walking along the promenade uh, during the course of an afternoon. I remember walking along one day and in the sand there, an artist, a sand artist, Artist, uh, had built a depiction of the crucifixion and I have to say that in artistic terms it was absolutely superb it really was took a breath away and of course people were throwing money to this guy that's how we made his living and indeed people were crossing themselves and one thing and the other and uh, I, I looked at it really and, and I had a great conviction that I should shout out at the top of my voice stop stop Yes, Jesus died for your sins as he died for mine, but he's no longer on that cross. He's alive. He's been risen from the dead. Now, confession time, I have to say to you that I lost my bottle and I didn't do that. I've had to live with that for the best part, I guess, of 20 years. Didn't do uh, what I should have done and missed an opportunity 
for proclaiming the gospel to many people. But you see, as you read your way through the Acts of the Apostles, you will find that whenever the early church leaders preached about Jesus, they preached about him crucified and risen from the dead. First epistle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. Well, he reminded them that uh, if the Lord Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then his preaching was in vain and our faith is futile. But he went on, of course, to argue and to explain that Jesus has been raised from the dead in the letter that he wrote to the Romans. First chapter, before he said anything else virtually, the Apostle Paul wrote that the Lord Jesus has been declared with power to be the Son of God by, by his resurrection from the dead. Declared with power to be the Son of God. How? By his resurrection from the dead. So doctrinally, we see the power of the resurrection as being of vital importance as far as we are concerned. Well, that's fine, you might say to me, doctrinally, Hugh, but what about day to day? What about practically? How does the resurrection affect our everyday living? Well, let me just mention one or two things. Obvious, really. We pray to our Heavenly Father. How do we do that? We do so in Jesus' name. Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Well, amongst other reasons, we pray in Jesus' name, name because Jesus is alive. That's a practical example of the power of his resurrection. If he were dead, it would be pointless praying to our Heavenly Father in his name. There would be no power. The same applies, of course, to the promises of God towards us. For example, he has promised never to leave us or to forsake us. Now, how on earth, you might say, is that possible? And the answer is, it's possible because he is alive. Darren preached from John's Gospel in chapter 14 last Sunday morning. And amongst other things, well, he reminded us that our Lord Jesus, when he was speaking to his disciples, said to them, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be with me. I'm not sure that they understood, but when we look at those verses and apply them to ourselves and understand what the Word of God is saying, they're absolutely thrilling. The Lord Jesus is saying there uh, that he had to leave his disciples. He had to go and prepare a place for them. He went the way of the cross, but then he said that he would come back to fetch them as he's coming back to fetch us, to take them and us to be with him where he is forevermore. Now, how on earth is he able to do that? Well, it's straightforward. And it emphasizes the eternal security we know in him. He is able to do that because he is alive. Because he is alive. Last Sunday morning, Lisa uh, led us in singing one particular chorus which had a line in it. I've written it down here. Which said, Jesus is enough for me. Jesus is enough for me. He is my total and utter all sufficiency. Why? Because he is alive. Because he is alive. Going back to uh, our ministry over the years in Spain, I remember when uh, Elizabeth and I were at the Baptist Church in Javier. We were there for two and a half years and we saw some great things happen and people were being converted and people that we had opportunities to talk to the Lord about. One lady, her name was Marion, we talked to her on several occasions about the Lord and uh, I remember Elizabeth saying to her on one occasion, Marion, she said, the Lord Jesus is more real to us than you are and we can reach out and touch you. And Marion was astounded at that. I expect she thought, although far too polite to say so, that we were a couple of babblers. That doesn't make any difference. Listen, how, how were we able to say that Jesus is more real to us than Marion was and we could reach out to touch her? Well, it was because, of course, that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And we're able to prove him in our lives every moment of every day. Practically there, and you'll be able to think of more examples. Practically, the power of the resurrection as a reality for everyday living. Well, there we are. How are we going to finish this morning? The resurrection at At Gavodiat. Let me suggest this to you. If I just say to you, Jesus is alive, 
you, wherever you are at this very moment, respond by a hallelujah. Okay? Let's try that together. Don't be shy now. Don't be shy. Full volume. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Well done. Let's do it in Welsh. That's fairly straightforward. It really is. The Welsh word for hallelujah is exactly the same as the English word. Hallelujah. So I'll speak a few words in Welsh first, and then you respond with a hallelujah. My riesi wedi ai atgyfodi. Hallelujah. Indeed. I think the Welsh hallelujah from where I'm sitting was louder than the English one. Thanks ever so much for listening to me once again. Let's just finish this morning by saying the grace together. Let's join together in the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good day.